We are in the third of our series in what do we believe. We've looked at who is God. We've looked at who is Jesus the Christ. And this week our topic is sin? Really? Is that something people still believe in today? Is that something that people outside of this church, outside of the Christian faith, consider at all? Or is it just one of those strange words that people who go to church use? Well, in Genesis chapter 3, we find ourselves in this place called the Garden of Eden. This is the place, some would say an actual physical place. Some would say an allegorical depiction of perfection. This is the place where the story of God's relationship with his people begins. Satan, the devil, was an angel who, at some time prior to this, had fallen from heaven. That is to say, he had rebelled against the will of God the Father and was speaking to the woman in the Garden of Eden in the form of of a slithery snake. Moses calls this the serpent and the serpent is a symbolic representation of Satan. The serpent is said to have communicated with Eve. So this physical serpent that Eve sees and talks to is not your ordinary reptile. It, it is a guise, a cunning disguise to trick Eve into doing something wrong. And so we learn that the man Adam and the woman Eve fall from their perfect condition before each other and before God. They fall from this position because they disobey God's explicit command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This disobedience was the first act of human rebellion against God our Father. The theological term we use to describe mankind's condition as a result of this disobedience is sin. But sin is perhaps a word that has become too familiar in our language. The literal translation in Scripture is more depravity that's a whole lot different, isn't it? Depravity speaks of moral and spiritual corruption. Prior to this fall into depravity or sin, Adam and Eve have enjoyed moral and spiritual purity before each other and before God. Then they lose this purity as a result of their actions. What happens in our Bible passage? There are two trees that are given special attention. Neither of these trees have any innate, special or magical powers to them. You won't be able to, be able to find a good tree and a bad tree somewhere in the ancient Middle East. These trees are a metaphor for good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was something that God commanded Adam to abstain from. Adam was not to avoid the tree because it had rotten fruit. It's not as if the tree was physically poisonous in any way. The simple reason why the man and the woman were not to eat of this particular tree is that God told them not to. God did this as a test of their obedience. And it is a perpetual test of our obedience also. So long as these two first humans obeyed God, they would enjoy everlasting life, symbolized by the other tree, the tree of life. But as soon as they decided to disobey God and eat what he commanded them not to eat, they would die. So long as we follow the way of the Lord and trust in Jesus Christ for our salvation, we will enjoy everlasting life. But if we decide to disobey God, to abandon Jesus, to follow our own way, then we too 
will fail to inherit eternal life. That is what is happening in our Genesis story. Satan, through the serpent, convinces them to do the opposite of what God wanted, and this they do. This familiar story that many of us heard as little children in Sunday school is the single most tragic event in all of human history. For in this opening account in Genesis, we see mankind becoming separated from God. And because he's separated from God, he's no longer perfect. And because he is imperfect, he is depraved, full of sin, sinful. This morning we're going to look at what happens as a result of this act of disobedience. We're going to see just how far these consequences reach and we'll look at the solution to the problem of sin. So first of all, the consequences of this thing we call sin. Considering we're dealing with the single greatest act of folly in human history, to be honest, the consequences don't seem too bad to begin with. Well, think about it. The serpent is told that he will crawl on his belly and eat dust. Okay, not very nice. The punishment for the woman is painful childbearing and submission to her husband's rule. I'll let you decide which of the worst of those two. Um. <laughs> the punishment for Adam is that he has to work the ground filled with thorns and thistles in order to make a living. Surely there has to be more of a punishment than that. And of course, there is. God says to Adam, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And Eve says to the serpent, But God said you should not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Either, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And after the fall into disobedience and sin, God says this to Adam. You will return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So something happened to the human race that day, which is bigger than birth pains and prickly plants. On that day, when they disobeyed God, Adam and Eve died. Not a physical death, but a spiritual death. So the punishment for the fall into sin is not primarily physical in nature. It's spiritual. Spiritual death. By banishing Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, God is banishing them from his perfect presence with them. And showing them that the life they had while they were there is now gone and that there is no way that they can get it back in their own power. After God has banished them, he places cherubim around to guard the garden. But we see cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant and on the veil of the Holy of Holies. And we see them elsewhere in the writings of the prophets. These angelic creatures signify the holy presence of God. So forget plush green plants for food. Forget nice scenery and flowing rivers. That's not what the Garden of Eden is about. This was a place that enjoyed the manifest presence of God the Father. A place of spiritual perfection. And now that Adam and Eve, because of what they've done, they're driven out of it. It's a startling picture of their spiritual death and consequently our spiritual death. The consequences of the fall into sin is nothing less than the complete fracture of our relationship with God our Father. What's the consequences of this thing we call sin? What about the extent of sin? How does this fall from the presence of the grace of God affect us, if at all? Well, the Word of God tells us Romans chapter 5 is a passage of scripture all about the problem and extent of sin. It says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. 
Sin came into the world through one man, Adam. Sin results in death, so death is spread to all men. Adam's sin was passed to every single person after him, and you and I are on that list. And in Romans chapter 5, Paul says, One trespass led to condemnation for all men, and by this one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So, because Adam sinned, did something wrong, became a sinner, one who does wrong, and we came from Adam, we are all born sinners too. So Adam's fall affects all of us also. We're condemned to spiritual death just like he was. We're not permitted into God's presence. And if we physically die and enter eternity without resolving the matter, things will stay that way forever. Word tells us that each of us is so depraved that on our own, we want nothing to do with God. Every part of our being is tainted by this thing called sin. Our minds, our hearts, our wills, our desires, our actions, our intentions, anything you can think of that has to do with who you are is corrupted by sin. Isaiah 59. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt. Your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue mutters wicked things. St. Paul writes, none is righteous. No, not one. That's our behavior. No one understands. That's our minds. No one seeks for God. That's our desire. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This depravity, the extent of sin, reaches every single person who has ever lived, is living, or ever will live. And it reaches every facet of their being. No part of us is not tainted with sin. How depraved are we? Totally depraved. We are dead in our sin. There is no spiritual life in us. We are a spiritual corpse. All of this because of what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Is the message coming across about sin? So it's easy to see that this was a monumental turning point in human history. This one event set the whole human race on the path to hell for an eternity without God. Thankfully, however, the story doesn't end there. Praise the Lord indeed. We have a solution for sin. Whew. It was all getting a bit heavy, wasn't it, really? Sometimes this sin thing can be a bit heavy, and purposefully so this morning. Because talking about sin and depravity it can be so depressing. It's like watching the evening news. Why are we even bothering with it? Well, yes, depravity is a depressing subject, which is why we don't talk about it very often. It only stays depressing, though, if we leave the next part out. God has provided a way out of our sinful depravity, has he not? This is only the beginning of the story. There is a way out an escape route, salvation from our depravity. That is why the good news is so good, because the bad news is so bad. God solves the depravity problem for us. God knew this moment would come from all of eternity. And he says to the enemy on the day that he thinks he has won, he says to him, the seed of the woman is going to crush you. You will, bruise her. you will bruise his heel, but he will bruise your head. What does this mean? Well, I think you might know the next part of the story. You probably do. As the child said to the Sunday school teacher when asked a very difficult question, Sir, I don't know the answer, but it's probably Jesus. It usually is. 
answer might be Jesus. Well, let's hope it is. Anyway, we'll leave that till next week when we look at what Jesus achieves for us. Let's bow our heads. And so, Heavenly Father, as we consider again this problem of sin, depravity in our hearts and our lives, in every part of us, we give you thanks for your word to us, which is so clear, so full of reference to this difficult situation we find ourselves in. And yet we know there is good news to come. And so we say, come, Lord Jesus. Restore us to your side. Guide us, the great Redeemer, in all that we are and do. Amen.